Welcome to One Mind Zen. Tonight's Dharma talk is given by Ron Kisen Stevenson. So I'd like to talk about what's so right about the Eightfold Path. We all know that the Eightfold Path starts with right vision or right um, view or right understanding. And it's followed by all the others, right intent, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. But what is right? Uh, and I think we tend to focus on things that consume our minds these days. And in contemporary society, I find that what's right and even what's real is an ongoing argument. Um, there's no perfect outlet for the verification of facts. If you look into American history, the, the media has always been polemical. Uh, from the time of the formation of the Republic. The term yellow journalism was coined in the 19th century uh, to describe the type of uh, hyperbole and sensationalism. Uh, it was one of the factors that helped push the United States into its war with Cuba, uh, or I'm sorry, war in Cuba. It was the United States and Spain, uh, Cuba and the Philippines uh, were acquired. So this still hasn't changed. We're still constantly bombarded with ads, uh, justifications for wars, for policies. Um, and we really have difficulty sometimes figuring out what is right and what's not right. So one of the problems that I see that's inherent is in this is that we have many sides that tend to see things from different perspectives. And we tend to see right view uh, in kind of solipsistic terms that ignores the perspectives of others in a kind of nasal, uh, nasal, navel gazing way. <laughs> nasal gazing is a new term. So in all sorts of issues from economic and cultural issues, uh, women's reproductive rights, gun control, taxation. We're typically presented with two mutually exclusive views, different views of the world completely that are packaged into opposing narratives. Ultimately, they cancel each other out because one side just yells at the other and the other yells back. And then when we try to actually research the issues, we're stymied by things like algorithm censorship. Um, it's easier now than ever to cling to a packaged pre-structured view of reality. And in Buddhism, we know that leads away from the path of awakening. Even in entertainment, when you think about it, um, we glorify violence and violence for a cause in very black and white hat type of terms that thinking gets instilled. Uh, but even if we get beyond the effects of society's pervasive conditioning, we may find that there is actually no one correct way to see things. There, is, there are just so many different approaches to the truth. So right view then might mean not clinging to any views. Is there a, a viewless view? And you know, too often my truth is used to invalidate yours. This happens when we embrace a narrative emotionally and not critically. That's the point of the koan, the famous koan, the wind or the flag in which the two monks are arguing whether it's the flag or the wind that's moving until the teacher comes by and admonishes them both. It's your mind that's moving. Likewise, uh, the Buddha admonished monks for arguing about the Dharma, condemning them both. Do we have such koans today? Well, searching for an example is as easy as turning on the internet 
in one thread I recently read, one camp was arguing that the president's handling of the economy is the cause of inflation. The other camp was arguing that the president has no impact on inflation and they placed the blame only on consumer price gouging. Now it's convenient for one side to, to forget that the president's military uh, budgets that have increased, uh, the uh, failure of, of different stimulus packages and um, the use of, of economic sanctions and so forth are putting pressures on prices worldwide and causing scarcities. And it's just as easy for the other tribe to forget that they also implement the same policies and that there are other factors involved than just the president. So for both sides, <clears throat> it's the mind moving. They're repeating mutually exclusive narratives in a loop. And those narratives have elements of truth and denial. But rather than examine their respective positions, they fall in line with the narrative. Why? I think to a certain extent, facts matter less to us emotionally than our tribe's narratives. Um, eventually, if we argue in this manner, it becomes clear that there's no sincere attempt to explore the nuances of the issue. It just feels good to be right and for the other to be wrong. And the need to be right also reflects a desire to be part of a tribe, doesn't it? Which is a way to differentiate ourselves from another tribe and reinforce that sense of self, that ego self. I define myself by my views and I define others by the views that I dislike. Uh, so ironically, the search for truth may have less to do with facts than with justifying a false sense of some enduring separate self. Um, but do we really need to choose in a um, false dichotomy, if you will? Um, a big piece of the puzzle is our limited perspective. The inability to see a larger picture that considers a diversity of perspectives. Everybody's experience is different, just like the uh, several blind men and the elephant who uh, simplistically believed their own limited ex experience to be universal. So if we go along with the tribal narrative, we do so at the expense of truth because truth has so many sides and so many multiple perspectives. Dependent, uh, dependent origination makes that pretty clear. There are numerous interlocking influences that create the preconditions that uh, cause karma or what comes after. Uh, karma is the cumulative effect of an impossibly complex interplay of conditions. Numerous parties in life are inter impacted in numerous different ways. So what's right or wrong or true isn't always clear or the same even for all parties involved. So then how do we even talk about anything called right view? Well, the phrase right view is a translation of the Pali, Samaditi. Here, right view doesn't mean that there's only one way to look at things. Sama translates as completed, perfected, or fulfilled, similar to summa in Latin, which is part of the word consummated. DT is view or vision, the perspective that we take and how we perceive. Um, it's similar to the English word theory, which comes from the Greek word theo, meaning behold, which is irrelevant. <laughs> But our theory of life is our diti, the perspective from which we view things. It can become something that helps guide our judgments and our decisions. And it can become an embedded premise that colors our perspective. So what the Buddha is talking about in right understanding or right view is actually then perhaps right theory or right approach. Theories, as we know, are evaluations to be verified, rejected, or revised. 
the right approach to truth is to be detached enough or unattached enough to hold it loosely and to take into account its many different and often contradictory aspects. Um, through this process, we can open our mind to all possibilities, empty that cup, and keep learning new facts that can alter initial assessments. So spiritual practice, in my opinion, needs to embrace multiple perspectives. I think what the Buddha is encouraging us to do here is to be more equanimous about the opinions we hold, to become more aware of what we think and inquire more deeply into why we might think that way. And so far, we've discussed the first of the Eightfold Steps, but you can see how this sets the stage for all the other steps. We need to submit our most cherished assumptions to rigorous questioning. Um, and let's take a look at right view. Can there even be right view? I'm, I'm sorry, right intention. Can there even be right intention without right view? Um, whenever there is a controversy and there seems to be support being drummed up, we're always told that our side is honorable and the other side is despicable. They are always the devil. And we are always the angel. Um, Disputes are sometimes creations of our own bias confirmation. We maintain an unforgiving bias towards our enemy. We try very hard to see the worst in them. We speculate about their motives and about what they might do. But beneath these cartoonish battles of good versus evil, there is that existential fear, that fear of our own loss that fear that doesn't understand or consider the non-permanence of self and the underlying equality of all beings. We exclude mutual understanding when our view is narrowly focused on our own self-interest. A willfully blind view is not a right view. And of course, right view doesn't also mean that we endorse a view other than our own. It only means that we listen more carefully and respond more thoughtfully. And how do we start with this? As Buddhists, I guess we pretty much start with the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, uh, the underlying unity of, of all, expressed as metta or ahimsa. Uh, we know that life entails mental suffering and that suffering is caused by a continual clamor for that which we can't attain or hold on to. We know that our actions have consequences for the whole of sentient life, and that we're part of the matrix of suffering, and that we can be part of the matrix of salvation. When we stop ignoring concerns of others and the perspectives of others, we are less likely to enforce our own aims at the expense of others. And of course, I think we all struggle with this, at least I speaking for myself. So we have a model for right action, don't we? We have the figure of many armed Avalokitesvara. Is there also a model for right view? Well, yes, we have the seated Bodhisattva or future Buddha ready to rise to the needs of others. Kuan Yin, of course, literally means hears and heeds the cries of the world. It's the literal meaning. There's nothing more fundamental to right view than listening. The word quan actually means attending, doesn't necessarily mean uh, seeing or listening. We need to embody more active listening, responsive listening, equanimous listening, fair and equitable listening, deep listening. So the social narratives are always there to distract us, manipulate us, neutralize us, uh, and deafen us to the cries of the world. Uh, we will never hear 
the cries of those that we have injured on the other side. Uh, the only cries we will hear likely are those that we are told to sympathize with. Cries of the weak are silenced while the pleading demands of the strong pull on our heartstrings. Uh, but we are bodhisattvas. We can rise to the cries of all sentient beings, not just some. Yes, we can act more rightly, but ironically to do so, we have to shed self-righteousness, open our hearts and minds to what and whom we vilify. Right view means rejecting divisive social narratives in search of a more encompassing and compassionate perspective to the extent that we are possible. Particularly, I think it means rejecting narratives that punch down at the vulnerable or create personal enmity or scapegoats. Divisiveness is of course a permanent feature by now of our society. We won't solve it by contributing to it. Are we ready to step out of the social narratives into a new perspective that supports and saves all sentient beings? Are we ready to embark on a lifetime practice of right view? If so, then I think it's time to let go of views and start from a place of deep listening. Again, that doesn't mean agreeing with others' positions, but listening to the concerns that underlie them. Right understanding must be mutual understanding. Thank you.